So today we are going to discuss COVID and allergy immunology interaction. And predominantly, I'm going to restrict my topic to COVID immunology. Now, you know, it is a very interesting topic, COVID immunology. The host immune response is the critical factor in driving COVID and the analysis of the this response will provide a very clear picture of how the host response impacts disease and severity in some individuals. While most infected people will only show mild symptoms or no symptoms. Early analysis of the RNA sequences revealed some interesting features. There was a very variable response of the interferon stimulated response and HLA class 2 down regulation. Interestingly, in subjects who had a mechanical ventilator and acute respiratory failure had a novel B cell derived granulocyte population. Importantly, there were circulating leukocytes which do not express high levels of pro-inflammatory cytokines and chemokines, clearly suggesting that COVID-19 cytokine storm is driven by cells inside the lung. So it is very crucial to study the host immune response from acute and covalent individuals. And that provides molecular insights into these mechanisms by which we may be able to en enable protection and long-term immune memory, which can design prophylactic and therapeutic measures to overcome future outbreaks of similar COVID or coronaviruses. So this was an early hypothesis. The acute SARS appeared in December 2019. It precipitated a global pandemic, but there were many parts in Africa where there were fewer than expected COVID-19 cases and lower rates of mortality. So is it the individual human leukocyte antigen alleles that affect both susceptibility and severity of viral infections? In the case of COVID-19, such an analysis can contribute to identify individuals who are at a higher risk of disease and epidemiological level of understanding of the differences between countries and epidemic patterns. It is recognized also that the first antigen exposure influences the consequence of subsequent exposure. For example, people think that people of South Asian ancestry from where we come probably have a lower predilection to severe disease. And this was a theory which proposed that incorporating HLA antigens, the original antigenic sin or OAS effect in presentation of viral peptides could explain the differential susceptibility or resistance to SARS-CoV-2 infections. So now what we know from this, from the current available immunological and HLA data, the clinical course of infection with SARS-CoV-2 is strongly dependent on the relationship between virus and host immune interactions in which the host HLA plays a central role in activation of the immune response. This is, there is a scope for studying the role of HLA in COVID-19 and we need to do public health studies, epidemiological studies to look at HLA profiles of host immune determinants. Such studies should include HLA typing of COVID-19 patients to unravel the complexity of disease response and inform and make personalized or customized therapies. In addition, the prior history of COVID infection in the patient could be relevant in the magnitude of immune response of current SARS-CoV-2 infection, a phenomenon referred to as the OAS, original antigenic sin. This concept refers to cross-reacting immunity due to past infections of similar coronavirus strains, which must be considered in interpreting the immune response to infections and vaccinations. So obviously when pathogenesis of COVID is not defined, but reports from many countries indicate virus have the same mechanism by which it enters or invades the host cells. We don't know the origin of uh, SARS-CoV-2, but one thing we know is that a spike protein is associated with its receptor and the viral RNA is encapsulated and polyadenylated and encodes various structural and non-structural polypeptide genes. These polyproteins are cleaved by proteases that exist crimotrypsin-like activity. Although the TMP RSS2, which is the transmembrane serine protease, is a major protease which contributed to the COVID activation and linked to SARS-CoV activation, current evidence from single cell RNA sequencing analysis show that ACE2 and TMP RSS are not expressed in the same cell, suggesting the involvement of other proteases like catepsin B and L in this process. Also, we know that the viral tract in the novel computational approach screens various RNA sequences of the virus. There has been a major change in the bronchioalveolar lavage immune cell landscape during severe SARS-CoV-2 infection. Interestingly, such lavages have yielded 
the viral tract co-infections of monocytes within the human metanumovirus following the dampening of the interferon response. So clearly we now know better about immunopathology of the COVID. We clearly know that the abnormal host response or overreaction of various inflammatory cytokines lead to a transcriptional footprint of SARS-CoV-2 infection which is distinct from highly pathogenic coronaviruses or similar respiratory viruses like IV, HPIV3, RSV. It is very noteworthy that despite of the blunted interferon 1 and 3 response to SARS-CoV-2, recent studies have shown a consistent chemokine signature. So COVID immunology has two things, transcriptional footprint and a consistent chemokine signature. And therefore, from a clinical standpoint and signature biomarkers, we know that there is a trinity of immunity, inflammation and intervention. We know that there is a cytokine signature which is available and the inflammatory immunological cytokine signature helps us to predict severe COVID and death in people. And therefore, COVID immunology and treatment options are important. Also, it is not just about antibodies. The B cells and T cells both mediate immunity in COVID. So clearly what happens in COVID? When SARS-CoV-2 is trapped, there is an adequate immune response, timely innate adaptive response, quick type 1 interferon response, efficient clearance by the macrophages of the virus, and activation of the Th1 cells and the B cells which make neutralizing antibodies. That is what happens in 80 to 85% of people where there is a very efficient immune system which clears the virus through a macrophage Th1 B cell neutralizing antibody system and the type 1 interferon is delayed. However, in people with comorbidities, severe diseases or people whose immune response is penetrated by the SARS-CoV-2 virus, there is an inadequate immune response where the type 1 interferon is delayed or limited. There is endothelial, epithelial and uh, cell death and leakage. There is overactive and exhaustion of T cells and NK cells. And there is an activated macrophage accumulation with cytokine storm and death. So clearly we have various predictors of mortality. There are dynamic COVID-19 immune signatures in various biomarkers which are associated with poor prognosis. And there is a risk stratification of people hospitalized with COVID, including age, male sex, white cell count, lymphocyte count, platelet count, hemoglobin, HSCRP, the various other enzymes, including LDH and D-dimer. So typical SARS-CoV-2, 80% is self-limiting, 15 to 20% is severe, and 1 to 2% is fatal. In the first stage of the immunology or the stage one of the dysregulated immune response, it is asymptomatic, there is innate immune activation, there is viral engagement of PAMs, and a low type 1 interferon response. In the second stage, there is a non-severe symptomatic adaptive immune activation. There is generation of specific antibodies and T-cell response, and there is a release of DAMs. While in the stage three, there is a severe immunoinflammatory respiratory response, where there is a cytokine release syndrome with IL-1, IL-6, TNF, GM-CSF, interferon, gamma, and others. There is a coagulopathy and complement activation and a cytokine storm-like situation. So clearly we know the temporal designs. For example, symptoms before onset, the PCR is likely to be very high and many a time by second week, the PCR is likely to be negative. We have different types of antibody response. There are high affinity antibodies, which are generated by a maturation of somatic rearrangements and hypermutation of IgG genes. There are non-neutralizing antibodies which recognize viral epitopes that do not distinguish infective from non-infective virus. And then there are these crucial neutralizing antibodies which recognize the viral epitopes, which eliminate or generally diminish inactive virus critical for preventing reinfection. And development of non-neutralizing antibodies are typically preceding that of neutralizing antibodies. So remember, when we have antibodies, there are neutralizing antibodies, there is opsonization, there is sensitization of our natural disease, killer cell killing, there is sensitization of mast cells, and there is complement activation. So obviously, when SARS-CoV-2 is predicted, how does one predict the time course of adaptive immunity? This is a diagram which shows that when we are inhaling the SARS-CoV-2 infection, there is an innate immune response to the virus. There is a dendritic cell activation and uptake of viral antigens. There is induction of adaptive immunity, which will lead to Th helper cells making cytokines, TL regulatory cells regulating inflammation, cytotoxic T cells killing infected cells, and follicular cells inducing antibodies like B and D cells. 
and then of course we have memory T cells and B cells. So clearly, induction of SARS-CoV-2 specific memory T and B cells are important for long-term protection. The T follicular helper cells indicate maturation of humoral immune response and establishment of a pool memory B cells, which rapidly respond to plausible reinfection. The specific CD4 T cells are important in eliciting potent B cell response, antibody affinity maturation, spike specific T cells, which correlate with IgG and IgA titers. This robust immune response with spike specific neutralizing antibodies, the memory B cells and circulating T follicular health cells are found in people who have recovered from SARS-CoV-2 infections. So when you see the immune response against the coronavirus, there is leukopenia, leukocytosis, lymphopenia. Lymphocyte counts of 800 cells and reduce their chance for survival. So as the lymphocyte counts drop, just like there is a like lymphocytopenia, like HIV AIDS, there's a direct effect of virus on the T cells through apoptosis. The dendritic cells have a huge role in the same also. The CT uh, cytotoxic lymphocytes and NK cells also have a huge role in the activation. And CD4, CD8 also with HLA clearly are blunted, blunted and blunted. If you see the activation from the high proportions of HLA DR and HLA CD8, CD25, CD28, CD2069 expression in the T cell subsets, there's a delayed development of adaptive immune response and then the virus pro uh, clearance is prolonged and you get a severe human response. So clearly, we now recognize the generation of neutralizing antibodies as they recognize the viral antigen by the antigen presenting cells. So understanding the immune response, understanding the HLA class 1, class 2 epitope pools have been used to detect CD4, CD8 T pools of population from the covalent plasma of COVID-19 patients. And these responses have been studied in detail. And intriguingly, what has been found that 40 to 60% of non-SARS-CoV-2 exposed individuals are possessing CD4 cell responses against SARS-CoV-2, indicating some degree of cross-reactivity between coronaviruses. Both C and cell-mediated and humoral-mediated immune system defense have effector cytokines like interferon gamma, which inhibit the viral replication and enhance antigen production. So clearly we now know that it has been postulated that there is a secretion of a novel short protein encoded by ORF3B, which inhibits the explosion of interferon beta and enhances viral pathogenicity. We also know now there are chemokine produced activated T cells, which make cytotoxic molecules like granzyme B, which directly kill epithelial cells and eliminate the pathogens. So we are understanding better and better about the immune response. As I told you that the host immune response has a varied interferon stimulated response to HLA class 2 downregulation. And obviously, we are understanding better on immunology. Classically in patients, these were the five, six things which we saw as biomarkers to look at immunology. The first one was lymphocyte and neutrophil interacts. That is NLR, neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio. If it is more, it is more severe. The D-dimer, the HSCRP, the IL-6, the LDH and the ferritin, if they are elevated, we know there is a biomarker signature of survivors versus non-survivors. So from the WBC count, we now know that the RDW, if it is more than 14.5, if the neutrophil lymphocyte ratio is abnormal, there is a challenge. There could be leukocytosis, neutrophilocytosis. There could be lymphopenia, lymphocytopenia, platelet count or thrombocytopenia. Various other biochemical parameters could be abnormal. The ESR could be non-specifically high. The CRP, ferritin, PCT, IL-6 could be abnormal. And various other biomarkers could be abnormal. And there's very good outrage. What happens is this immunology activates inflammatory and thrombotic processes. And that is what kills. So the responsibility of severity of disease is not only on viral load, but on immune dysfunction and various other things. And it's important to predict who will deteriorate within 24 hours of hospital admission. There is a H score for macrophage activation syndrome. There is a QCSI, Quick COVID Severity Index. And this is how it interacts. This is the immune response and immunopathology of the cells, of T cells and the B cells and the humoral response and the cell response. And some may have a lower levels and recovery. And some may have high levels of cytokine signature, cytokine storm, and you might get a cardiorespiratory complication and death. 
So it is very important to understand that when the respiratory system is impacted, the interferon response and the interferon landscape is important. We know interferon is expressed in COVID-19 based on the location, viral load, age, and severity. We know that there is a protective effect on the airways through interferon pathways. And we know that the epithelial cells produce protective interferons while CDC is expressed the negative interferons. So obviously, when we look at the interferon response, severe COVID is characterized by overproduction of immune mediators. And the role of type 1 and type 3 interferon families has been debated. We all know that high interferon 3 may be protective and the upper airways are high with viral burden but do not have reduced risk of disease severity. So production of specific interferon 3 but not interferon 1 will denote milder pathology and may be able to clear the virus better. So remember interferons are overrepresented in the lower airways. In severe disease, there are gene pathways associated with increased apoptosis and decreased proliferation. And now there is a good data which is showing that dynamic production of interferons in SARS-CoV-2 infected patients might have opposing roles in distinct anatomical sites, upper respiratory airway and lower respiratory airway. Cytokine release syndrome has potential targets. We all know that there is recruitment of T cells which hyperinflamify the pro-inflammatory cytokine response. The SARS-CoV-2 infects and destroys T lymphocytes, contributing to lymphopenia, overwhelming viral load, magnifying inflammatory response and lymphocyte exhaustion. We clearly know that there are three stages. The first stage is where there is complete depletion of ferritin and lymphopenia. Then there is an amplification stage where more inflammatory mediators are poured, poured and poured. And ultimately, there is a consumption of all these inflammatory markers with multi-organ damage. So T cells in the COVID response is very crucial at the cytokine syndrome. We know that the macrophages are infected. Macrophages will present the COVID antigen to the T cells. The T cell will activate and differentiate. They will make the cytokines with different T cell subsets, including TH17. And then there is a massive bomb spot or release of cytokines, which amplifies immune response. However, CD8 T cells are producing very effective mediators to clear that virus. So obviously, the role of T cells in activation, exhaustion, and lipopenia is very well illustrated in this slide. And we clearly know that when there is immunopathology of COVID, there is depletion and exhaustion of lymphocytes, increase in neutrophils, cytokine storm induction, and antibody enha enhancement. So that is the time course of the immune response. Some will have a deleterious response and multi-organ failure, while some will eventually come out of this whole situation. So there have been molecules like CD6, which are co-stimulatory receptors expressed on T cells. For example, one of these humanized anti uh, CD6 monoclonal antibody is etilizumab. It's a humanized IG1 antibody. It binds to the domain of CD6 and it does dose-dependent inhibition of T cell proliferation. And it is a selective T cell co-stimulation modulator. So this current compound of monoclonal antibody, etilizumab, inhibits CD6 co-stimulation and modulates the pathogenic role of TH1, TH17 in various autoimmune disorders. And it downregulates the alcam CD6 interaction. It activates the T cell CD25 marker. It hyperphosphorylates and co-stimulates molecules like ICOS and CD28. It modulates signaling molecules like PMPA, AKT, STAT3, transcription factors, and inflammatory cytokines. So that is something which we know. And it also is migrating and trafficking B cells and chemokines. So clearly we can see that they can modulate the cytokines of TH1 and TH17. And obviously when it comes to the cytokine syndrome, we know that CD6 has a central role in immunoinflammation as a potential target. And clearly we know that you can see here in this diagram that the optimal immune synapse formation, activation and proliferation at the APC level, the pro-inflammatory cytokine secretion at the T effector site, and you can see the increased trafficking of the T effector cells in the target tissues. So if you give such a molecule, then what happens is there is down regulation of the pro-inflammatory cytokine secretion, decreased trafficking of the T effector cells in target tissues, inhibition of optimal sinus formation, co-stimulation, activation, proliferation, and restoration of regulatory pathways. This has been documented even at the sites of lung cells. So now we have three options available with us. Anti-CD6 monoclonal antibodies, 
which bind to the CD6 receptor and block the alkyam mediated T cell activation. It is immune modulation by regulatory T cells. They down regulate the pro inflammatory cytokines, IL6, IL2, TNF alpha, and IL17, and have a longer upstream pathway on duration. Should be used early in the disease when somebody is already on steroids and they are needing very high doses of oxygen. That's the time to use this one. We have all used the anti IL6 monoclonal antibody, which is not having any activation on immune modulation of the regulatory T cells. It blocks signaling of IL-6 alone. It has a shorter impact on the downstream pathway, which is tocilizumab. And we also have an anti-IL-1 receptor antagonist, Ankara-NR, which we have not, which we have used sparingly. So what is the difference between tocilizumab and ditilizumab? One is a cytokine receptor blocker, while other one is a cytokine formation blocker. They have different mechanisms of mechanistic differences and pathways of interactions. We have a host myriad of drugs, most popular and most impactful being corticosteroids. Of course, we have anti-CD6 monoclonal antibodies, we have IL-6 inhibitors, IL-1 inhibitors, anti-TNF alpha inhibitors, and so many other compounds which have been used. And this list is exhaustive and is persistent. So obviously immunity and immune response against SARS-CoV-2 and the adaptive system response is complex. And these factors may differ between natural immunity obtained by infection and vaccine generated immunity. So now there is a new concept called hybrid immunity. What is hybrid immunity? Hybrid immunity means people who have mounted a response due to natural infection. You can see on the tree here, memory B cells, CD4 T cells, CD4 T8 cells and antibodies. Vaccine immunity is a little better. And Shen Grotti in science wrote this very nice paper. The hybrid vigor can occur in different plant lines which breed together. And the hybrid is always a stronger plant. Something similar happens when natural immunity is combined with vaccine generated immunity. Then there is a 25 to 100 times higher antibody responses given by memory B cells and CD4 T cells with a broader cross variation. And that is where the world is headed. So now we are looking at immunological memory as a source of protective immunity. See, we are trying to have a natural immunity, vaccine generated immunity for two different paths of protection. The adaptive immune system consists of three branches, the B cells, the CD4 T cells, and the CD4, CD8 T cells. From a natural immunity standpoint, the immunological memory is observed for more than eight months in CD4 T cells, CD8 T cells, and memory B cells, where antibodies usually decline and partially they stabilize within a year. So the levels of immunity which can be placed on the spectrum of natural immunity against symptomatic infection over seven to eight months is clear cut. And most of them has been documented. Also remember that all we are doing is we have various variants now. There's a beta variant, gamma variant, iota variant, delta variant. The neutralizing antibody activity against most variants of concern is reduced for natural immunity and vaccine generated immunity. Most variants of concerns have mutations endangering the partial antibody escape. And there is an evidence of selection pressure to evade natural immunity. So the biological revelation relevance of reduction in neutralizing antibody potential against variants is most clearly evident from vaccine trials and observational studies. So this is what we are seeing the breakthrough infections. So hybrid immunity has become a new concept. We know this concept came earlier. This was predominantly seen with the shingles vaccines of shingles. We know in shingles vaccine prevent shingles which are given to people with privately infected with varicella zoster virus and there were 97% efficacy with antibody response and such combinations might be the useful things. That is why currently we are looking at a mix and match strategy of combining two different kinds of vaccine with a heterologous prime boost regimen for a stronger immune response. So COVID immunology is a pleasant surprise. It keeps on changing and we need to leverage science to generate better immunity for COVID-19. Thank you for a patient hearing.